I'm, we're good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you all for coming and uh, welcome to all uh, of the panelists here. I'm gonna do introductions and then we are going to jump uh, right into it. So first, uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, Melissa Williams. I'm just going to, to read some of the wonderful things about all of the panelists. Melissa Williams is a visiting scholar at the Ash Center this year here at the Harvard Kennedy School. She is a professor of political science and the founding director for the Center of Ethics at the University of Toronto. Uh, her work uh, centers around a, 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 a cluster of really cool topics that include uh, group structured inequality, social and uh, political marginalization in the political arena, uh, cultural and religious diversity, and recently she has devoted her intellectual energies to exploring the future of democracy under conditions of uh, globalization. If you could all please help me in welcoming Melissa. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Jason Brennan. Uh, Jason, I think, has the qualification of having the longest title I've ever seen uh, as, a, as a professor. So here we go. Buckle in. All right. Uh, Jason is the Robert J. and Elizabeth Flanagan Family Chair and Provost Distinguished Associate Professor of Strategy, Economics, Ethics, and Public Policy at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. He is a regular contributor to Bleeding Heart Libertarians and has written extensively on, uh, on conservative ideas as they engage the public arena, including voting and democracy. His most recent book, which I brought for show and tell, is uh, irresistibly called Against Democracy. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have him here today. If you could please help me in welcoming Jason Brennan. <laughs> And uh, to my far left, we have Ilya Soman, who is a professor of law at George Mason University, a regular contributor to the Washington Post's Vola Conspiracy. Uh, Ilya has also written extensively on the role of knowledge in the public arena, including uh, a book that is so popular that it's already in its second edition. I brought that for show and tell, too. It is called Democracy and Political Ignorance. And uh, it's absolutely wonderful to have him join this panel today. If you could uh, join me in welcoming him. All right, so to start us off, I'm just going to say a few words, and then we're just going to get right into it. Uh, I want to begin with some an anecdotal observations, then, then offer you some, some brief data, and then uh, turn it over to our panelists to start unpacking uh, what's going on here. The anecdotal evidence, as some of you may know, is that for, for years now I've been running simulations here at the Kennedy School and a few other uh, of, Harvard's, uh, of Harvard's schools. And one of the simulations that I run uh, quite often is a simulation in which you get to uh, sit down in a small group and decide what kind of country you want to build from the ground up. And one of the major decision points is what kind of political institutions do you want? Do you want your country to be a theocracy? Do you want it to be a monarchy? Do you want it to be an authoritarian government? Do you want it to be a democracy? And, uh, and this is entirely your choice, and then you, you go on from there. And as many students know, know the punchline to this because we talk about it in our debriefs. Uh, democracy is in, uh, chosen in the order that I presented the options, right? It is uh, often at the very last uh, choice. We have a lot of folks who would much rather uh, run a theocracy or a monarchy than, uh, than a democracy. At first, I was shocked by this, but as it happened again and again and again, I began to really ask some questions about what's going on. And part of it, as, as we surface in debriefs, was, well, you know, we're, you know, the simulation we all know is a kind of crisis, and we'd, we'd prefer to be in charge of something that had a little bit stronger levers, levels, uh, levers of power uh, to do this. But part of it was also uh, a pretty profound uh, skepticism about the democratic institutions being able to help us through uh, some, some crises. And so that's anecdotally uh, my evidence for suggesting that there, there has been an attitudinal shift towards evaluating, uh, evaluating the, uh, the effectiveness minimally, if not the moral standing of democratic institutions. I'd also just like to read to you some, some uh, uh, statistics that have come out recently on some surveys. Uh, the survey targets millennials, but I think that uh, we can certainly expand things uh, further. It says that um, fewer than 30% of millennials believe it's essential to live in a country that's governed democratically, compared to 72% of those born before World War II. In uh, 2011, 24% of those born in the 1980s and after considered democracy to be a bad or very bad way of running the country. 
Among the same cohort of Europeans in 2011, only 13% said the similar, itself an increase from the 1990s when it was uh, 8%. Uh, so millennials got there earlier, but I would suggest that a whole bunch of the rest of the country is right along with them at this point. As, uh, as folks look over to what's been going on with Brexit and, uh, and with the uh, Trump candidacy, for many individuals on the right and left of the political spectrum, the, uh, the, the fact that Donald Trump was chosen by the Republicans to beat out individuals like Jeb Bush, who's visiting us this, uh, this semester, uh, like Marco Rubio, like even Ted Cruz, uh, someone who, um, by the lights of many, many Republicans, is profoundly unqualified, uh, on, just as a matter of what he knows to be President of the United States. Colin Powell today, I believe, if I'm getting this right, endorsed Hillary Clinton. This is just a, a long line of people doing so. Was, uh, was evidence that there's something wrong when that sort of individual is selected and now stands one, one, one voting day away from uh, ascending to the presidency. And right now what we're seeing in uh, Great Britain, more news coming out this week talking about how the banks are beginning to plan to, to leave. Uh, this is a, a, a consequence that economists saw coming quite, quite a, a while, ways away, but now uh, the people of Britain have to deal with the consequences of their vote to get out of the European Union. So folks are wondering, you know, democracy, what's going on? And uh, what I wanted us to have today is an opportunity to listen to three tremendous minds uh, wrestle with this question from very different perspectives and give us a, a chance to, to hear what they think and then to engage them. Uh, this is a really cool opportunity here uh, in the forum to have uh, people at the cutting edge of this, uh, of this question uh, give us their thoughts, interrogate each other, and then be interrogated by you. So we're going to get into it. What I wanted to do to start us off is to give uh, each one of you an opportunity uh, for just a little bit of time to e explore, uh, to share with us what you think, uh, you, how you think your work, um, uh, to surface the issues in your work that you think is most relevant to considering the questions about what's going on in democracy today. We'll have each one of you uh, share your thoughts, and then we'll start talking, talking to each other. Melissa, please. Great, thanks so much, Chris. It's a real honor to, to be part of this panel. Um, so the, the, the problem that I'm trying to grapple with in my current work is really arises from the fact that we live in a globalized world, and many of the problems that we confront simply uh, unfold on a scale of politics that it doesn't map well on well to the, the political institutions we have that have some capacity actually to make binding decisions. So. Uh, that, in addition to some of the challenges to democracy within nation states that you've already alluded to, um, uh, is on my mind. And one of the questions is whether or not it's possible to match political institutions that have some kind of governance capacity with the scales of the problems that actually exist uh, in a globalized world. And then the second part of the, the question is whether those institutions can be rendered democratically representative and accountable. Have you, have you arrived at any, any, have you taken a stake yet on any, on any of that or are you still at the uh, investigatory stage? I think there is potential, we will maybe get to talking about some of the ways of addressing the problems of contemporary democracy, some of which link to problems of political irrationality and voter ignorance that my colleagues here have addressed so thoroughly in their work. Um, and, and a key challenge there is how we can get smarter political decisions, smarter policies that actually respond to the interests of those who are affected by them in a way that can also be rendered accountable to those who are affected by them. That's the big challenge of arguably of democracy in general and of democracy at different scales of politics uh, in particular. And my work is inspired by uh, a very broad school of work in democratic theory called deliberative democracy, which is really grappling with this problem. It, it copes with the, the problem of political irrationality um, by, uh, by, by arguing that what we can do is design institutions that bring together the forms and sources of knowledge that are relevant to solving a problem, including the knowledge of those who are affected by a policy decision, and having them uh, deliberate with one another and gather the information that they see as relevant to a well-informed decision and generate uh, judgments that they can more or less agree upon. 
And those have a kind of prima, prima facie democratic legitimacy if they succeed in doing that. So I think that that's a very promising approach. There's been a lot of experimentation that's been going on at all, all different scales of politics, from participatory budgeting at the city level to constitutional reform and electoral reform at the provincial and national levels. I think there's potential for scaling that up to transnational politics as well. Great, thank you very much. Jason, your work. So despite what you might have heard or, or what my reputation is in public, uh, I'm actually a pretty big fan of democracy, but I'm a fan of democracy the way I'm a fan of the band Rush. And I'm surrounded by people that think Rush is the greatest thing that has ever happened and all of the musicians are the greatest virtuosos ever. And I'm just like, yeah, they've got a couple good albums and they, like, Neil Peart's a really good drummer. And when I say that, then I come across as the sacrilegious one among them. So democracies, I think they work really well. Democracies are overall the best places to live. There's a strong correlation between how democratic you are and how equal we are, your income per capita, the wealth of the poor, how much you protect civil and economic liberties. But at the same time, they have systematic problems. So imagine you're in a, a classroom, a, a final exam, and the professor says, I'm going to have a final exam at the end of this class. There's 700 of you. And I'm going to, instead of giving you each your own grade, I'm going to average all of your grades together, and you'll all get the same grade. You probably wouldn't study very hard. It's not because you're mean, it's not because you're stupid, it's not because you're evil, but it's because the incentives are all wrong. So in effect, that's what happens in democracy. Uh, we call this rational ignorance. The idea is that we've been looking for 65 years or more what voters know, how, how information affects their policy preferences, and the answer is they just don't know very much. Um, in effect, you might think of it as the top 25% of voters, if you give them a quiz of basic political knowledge, they'll get like an A- minus on it. The next middle 50%, they'll do slightly better or worse than chance, and the bottom 25% will make systematic mistakes on basic questions. And these are just basic questions like, who's your congressperson, which party is more left-wing or right-wing, and so on. These aren't even advanced questions such as, which public policies work better, what, how, what should you do about the economy, questions that require tremendous amounts of social scientific knowledge in many cases. So my worry about this is that it's, it's not just a bad thing that, that democracy is like this, because I think it might actually be an injustice, because unfortunately politicians do have a strong incentive to respond to voter preferences. There's quite a bit of independence there. It's not as though voter preferences immediately get translated into policy, but nevertheless there's a strong tendency for what politicians do to be the kinds of things that voters want. Well, what if voters are systematically misinformed? What if they support policies only because they don't know what they're talking about? Well, that might be an injustice, and to explain why that might be an injustice, uh, imagine a jury trial that goes as follows. Uh, Ilya is now being tried for capital murder, and he might get the death penalty or life in prison, and the case is being tried, and we, the facts have been presented to us, and then we retire to the jury room to deliberate, but you know, we ask each other, did you pay any attention to, the, to that? And you're like, no, I was reading Watchmen again, and you know, you're reading, uh, I guess, you know, some deliver of democracy, or I don't really like you to read, uh, and I'm, I'm on my phone reading The Vala Conspiracy, and, uh, and we're like, we didn't pay any attention. Uh, well, we have this transcript here, we could read it and find out what happened. Nah, it's too boring, I wanna go home. So we just flip a coin, heads, okay, you're guilty evil. And we would think that's grounds for overturning the decision. We think that decision is illegitimate because we made it that way. Suppose we decide to find you guilty because we just don't like Jewish people and you're Jewish. So we were anti-Semitic. Again, evil for us to do that. It would be an illegitimate decision. It would be wrong to enforce it. Or suppose we just subscribe to a bizarre conspiracy theory. We believe that you're one of the lizard people that comes from underground and is controlling. <laughs> about 7% of Americans claim they believe this. I'm not sure if that's true. That might just be being funny on a survey. We believe you're one of these lizard people and we want to get back at you. Again, evil. So if we're an irrational or an ignorant or an immoral jury, we would think the decision is wrong. We would think that juries have a fiduciary obligation to society at large and perhaps to the defendant too to make decisions in a competent way and in good faith. So, and why? Because they're making a high stakes decision that will be imposed upon a potentially innocent person, could deprive that person of life, liberty, property, and greatly affect their life prospects. And in a situation like that, you owe us competence and good faith. Unfortunately, electorates have a strong tendency to fail to meet that obligation. The good news is uh, elected officials and others have a significant amount of independence and they can often override voter preferences. And so we end up getting in democracy systematically better government than we might expect if democracies were perfectly responsive to uh, voters' preferences. So for me, I think of democracy as the value it has is simply the value a hammer has. It's purely an instrument for producing just policies. It has no value as an end in itself. And for that reason, I'm open to exploring as a research program alternatives to pure democracy, different kinds of representative government, or uh, different kinds of voting systems other than complete universal suffrage with equal voting rights by default. Thanks, Jason. Ilya. 
So I'd like to thank Chris for organizing this event and all of you for coming. And also, last but not least, the participants in this year's presidential election for making the study of political ignorance great again. Uh, they've certainly <laughs> uh, been a boon to those of us who write in this area, even if it's very bad for the public interest. Uh, and as the title of my book implies, I do, in fact, write about the problem of political ignorance and what perhaps can be done about. Uh, and the situation with political ignorance perhaps Perhaps is even worse than Jason said it was. He was being generous, I think, when he said that the middle 50% of voters uh, do okay. It's actually worse than that. On a very wide range of metrics, the public knows very little about even very basic things. For example, only about a third of Americans can name the three branches of the federal government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. On average, Americans have no idea how the federal government spends its money. They vastly underestimate, for example, the proportion that is spent on uh, big entitlement programs like Medicare and Social Security, which are actually among the largest items in the federal budget. On the other hand, they enormously overestimate what's spent on foreign aid, which is only about 1% of the federal budget, but the average voter thinks it's about 10 to 20 times greater. As a result, the average voter implicitly believes, if only we cut that foreign aid or waste, fraud, and abuse, that other great standby, we could be, solve all of our fiscal problems. And, Sadly, that's not the case. I can give many other examples like this, but uh, the evidence is pretty overwhelming, so I'm not going to go through it all right now. I'm happy to talk about it in more detail. It's also important to recognize something that's less widely understood, which is that on average, voters do a very poor job of evaluating even that information, which they do know. Uh, they tend to overvalue anything that reinforces their pre-existing views while ignoring or undervaluing anything which cuts against them. And this is true not just of low information voters. It's actually even more true of higher information voters who follow politics more closely. Uh, so what can we do about this situation? There are many kinds of proposals for trying to increase political knowledge. I'm not that optimistic that those proposals can work, though I discuss a lot of them in my book. One reason why is because political knowledge has been pretty stagnant the last 50 to 60 years, even though education levels have risen enormously, and thanks to the internet and other technologies, information is more easily available to people than ever before in human history. So simply educating people or making information available to them seems not to be nearly as effective as a lot of scholars might think. Uh, so instead, what I suggest is we look uh, not to try to make us better voters, but to try to make more of our decisions in settings where we have a better incentive to be informed. So if you're like most people, even though you guys are probably in the top 5 or 10 percent, most of you, in terms of political knowledge, I think still most of you probably spend more time acquiring information and considering it that every time you decide what TV set to buy or what kind of smartphone to get, then we decide who to vote for for president or for any other political office. Now, why is that? It's not because you think your smartphone is more important than who runs the government or that you think it deals with more complicated problems than, say, the president does or Congress does, is because you know that when you choose a smartphone, that thing will actually be in your pocket, and you'll pull it out, and there'll be all the cool apps, and it'll work, or in the case of the Samsung phone, perhaps not work, and catch on fire. So you have a pretty strong incentive to uh, acquire relevant information and to evaluate it in a reasonable way. On the other hand, in an election, the chance that your vote will make a decisive difference in a presidential election, it's about 1 in 60 million. Jason will tell you that it might be even lower than that, but even 1 in 60 million uh, is a pretty low odds. And while most people don't know those exact numbers, they do have an intuitive sense that doesn't make much sense to acquire a lot of political information. Uh, and therefore, most of them, in fact, do not. And when they do acquire it, they do a poor job of evaluating it because most of them are seeking out that 
information not for the purpose of seeking the truth, but for entertainment value or to cheer on your favorite political team, Team Red or Team Blue or others and so forth. Uh, so what I would suggest is that we can make progress by creating institutions where more of our decisions are like the iPhone decision and fewer are like the decision that we currently make at the ballot box. That is, we make more of our decisions by voting with our feet and fewer by more conventional voting. We can vote with our feet, as in the smartphone example, by deciding what products to buy in the marketplace or what civil society organization to join. We can also vote with our feet in decentralized political systems, deciding which city or town to live in or which state to live in. There is a lot of data, a lot of it discussed in my book, which show that when we make those kind of decisions, on average, we do a much better job from an information point of view uh, than when we make decisions at the ballot box. So I suggest that what we want to do is have a government that's much more limited and also more decentralized than what exists today, either in the US or most other advanced democracies. Uh, unlike in the case of Jason's book, this doesn't entail abolishing democracy, but it does entail making it more decentralized and also uh, limiting its powers more tightly uh, than is currently the case. There are obviously a lot of nuances and possible objections, and I'm happy to get into them in the discussion. Of course, I plan to write future books in this area, so I hope to learn from the concerns that people raise. This is a great start. Thank you all very much. So let's, uh, let's take off now and start, start interrogating each other's views. Um, Melissa, I'm going to start with you. you know, we've heard from both Jason and uh, Ilya uh, uh, you know, uh, a recitation of the kind of political ignorance that exists in society. But I was wondering if you could say more about deliberative democracy and, and how, how does a model that invites us to involve ourselves even more in the political process, even if we may not be incentivized right now to do so, um, and that seems to rest on us uh, having a certain amount of political knowledge. How, how do you push back on some, on, some of these, uh, on, on some of these concerns? Great, thanks Chris. Well, I think, let me begin with the, the point that my colleagues have both underlined, which I do not dispute, which is that most voters are not very well informed about the political issues or even the political candidates on which they're asked to decide at the voting booth. Now let's just take that as, as granted. I think there's nonetheless a kind of fallacy in the reasoning that we've heard from both colleagues, to put it over simply. And that is that the decisions, the outcomes are a function solely of the knowledge and judgment of each individual taken as an isolated knowledge unit. In fact, that's not the way we reach decisions. Uh, it's not the way we reach judgments. It's true that that voters don't have the incentive. So what they're talking about is what's called rational ignorance, that the payoff for gaining the information you'd need to have to make a fully informed decision is so small because the impact of your vote is so small as, that, as not to really have a significant impact on the outcome that you don't have the incentive to learn what you would need to learn in order to make a competent choice. Now, uh, but that is true actually with almost all of the decisions that we make, whether it's buying an iPhone or, or uh, uh, and let's just take the example of, of when we're sick and we need some kind of medical treatment. How do we decide what medical treatment we, we seek out? Well, we, we go to a doctor and we don't try to master all of the knowledge that the doctor has about the range of medications that's that might be effective against the illness that we have, we trust the doctor's judgment. We trust the doctor's knowledge. So that's a, the doctor is a trusted proxy. And we delegate some of our decision-making capacity to the doctor because we have trust in the doctor's knowledge. Similarly, that's what voters do when they go, go and, and tick off boxes in the polling booth. They have some knowledge but they're also relying on the cues that they get from heuristic proxies that they trust, that they see as trustworthy. So we have to look at then the quality of these mediating uh, proxies in our society. Are they, provide, are they good kind of gatherers of information, uh, consolidators of, no, of the available knowledge, and are they transmitting good cues to the voters who then have, are justified in trusting them when they cast their, their ballots? 
And um, you know, I think that, that what we haven't heard about, it, though it does come out in some of their arguments, is that in fact the cues that voters are relying on, uh, in particular the partisan cues that they're relying on, are problematic partly because of the problem of cognitive bias that Ilya briefly mentioned, the tendency of all of us to select that information which confirms what we already believe, that's called the confirmation bias, or we can think about the availability heuristic where we generalize from the facts that are familiar to us from our immediate experience to uh, conclusions that actually aren't warranted because they rely on facts that, uh, uh, that play out outside the realm of our experience. So this leads us to flawed judgments. Those are cognitive biases. So that's one kind of bias that we can, can bump into, both as individuals in our own reasoning and in mistakenly relying on proxies who are prone to these cognitive biases. The other kind of bias is a kind of self-interested bias, where the proxies actually have some motivation to, uh, to give us cues to choose in a certain way, but actually what they're motivated by is not an, a concern to get the answer right, but rather a concern to get us to support them in supporting the agenda that they prefer. And this is the problem with partisan cues, is that we have self-interested uh, proxies operating on both sides. And, um, and if you know, the overall effect of relying on those proxies is that voters make decisions based on distorted policy options that are put to them, then that creates a systemic distortion in the system as a whole. So, um, so what's the solution to the problem of self-interested bias in the proxies that voters rely upon? Well, one, one solution that deliberative Democrats are working on is to uh, help construct alternative uh, trusted proxies. And so one way of doing this, and there's some, been some fantastic exper experiments, and I'll just mention one, the British uh, Columbia Citizens Assembly on Electoral Reform, where ordinary citizens, a random sample of ordinary citizens, were brought together for a long time to think about what kind of electoral system the, the province should have. A very complex question. But they had access to experts, and they were able to request more information from ex experts. And they had the incentive and the opportunity to sift through all that complex information. And, and they were then able to come up with a, a plan that they thought was best for the province, which they then put to a vote. Citizens trusted them because they knew that the biases that might be more characteristic of an elected assembly were factored out by the fact of the random uh, uh, selection uh, uh, in the composition of this assembly. So a lot of biases get corrected in that way, both by bringing in a lots of different perspectives that might get left out in the filtering process of mainstream politics, and also by factoring out the partisan interests that people might have in, in, in distorting the information flows one way or the other. Anyway, a majority of citizens in British Columbia actually uh, voted to accept the plan that the Citizens Assembly, because they trusted those proxies. Now, there are all kinds of complexities in how to set up these institutions, and they're not a substitute for regular electoral politics, but they, I think, can be a very uh, useful, really valuable supplement to existing electoral processes um, and help to overcome some of the, the problems of bias in our political system. So, uh, Jason, I'm going to ask you first to, uh, so here's a proposal on how to address some of these concerns. Um, I'm guessing you're skeptical about the results that you'll get from that, uh, so please share with us why. Yeah, so when you, when you look at the democratic, deliber deliberate democratic literature, it's extremely optimistic, and a lot of it's being done by philosophers, and often it's written in the form of, if we follow the following deliberative norms, then certain things should happen as a result of that. We expect certain, like, we'll come to understand one another, see each other's reasons, and reach some sort of consensus or compromise, and it'll be really wonderful. Um, and then when you actually look at the empirical work on this, it's, some of it's positive, but a lot of it is negative. And I think on the whole, it's fairly negative, in part because 
people don't deliberate the way that philosophers want them to. And an, an analogy I use in the book is, I call it ideal fraternity theory. Uh, if you look at the uh, mission statements of various college fraternities like Sigma, Alpha, Epsilon, and so on, they have a bunch of norms that they want the men who join these fraternities to follow, and then if only the men follow these norms, really wonderful things would happen to their character and to the fraternities, but we know empirically they don't tend to follow those norms and a lot of bad things happen instead. So I think when you, when you look at the, and this was just, I think maybe it's a disagreement about the weight of the empirical evidence here, but when you look at the total empirical evidence testing the delivered different current hypothesis, I think you find fairly negative things. And uh, a nice review article, and it's a bit out of date at this point, but a really good review article to start with is by uh, Tally Mendelberg in 2002. She's a political scientist down at Princeton. Um, and she's reviewing all the extant sort of data and experiments up to that point. And she's finding things like most of the surveys are finding more polarization rather than less. There's a tendency to evade contentious questions. There's a tendency for people to walk away thinking, well, I agreed to this, but I didn't really believe it, and I regret my decision. Um, things like how, how good looking you are and how influential you are tend to dominate over things like reasons and evidence. Um, so I'm pretty pessimistic about delivered dem uh, democracy, but at the same time, I kind of want it to work too. Like I, I like the idea of having these deliberate fora and we randomly select a subset of uh, citizens and get them to deliberate. Um, I would prefer to do that to many of the other things that we do, but I'm just pessimistic that it's actually going to work. So I, I want to stay with you for a second, Jason, because we had with Ilya a, a picture of, you know, in light of polygonal ignorance, um, I believe that we should have a, a more limited government. Here's uh, how that should look. Melissa said, you know, there's political ignorance, but I still think the deliberative model can, can uh, address some of these concerns. We haven't yet heard, though, uh, about epistocracy, which is one of the centerpieces of your, uh, of your, of your book. So maybe you can share with us uh, what you think the way forward is. So what, what, what is an epistocracy? Sure. Here? So I think, uh, you know, I think what we, we're owed from the people who rule us is competent government. You should make comp decisions competently and in good faith. And there's lots of ways of implementing that. Maybe it will mean changing what government does. Maybe it means changing the size of government, how many people are governed. Maybe it means changing the timing of government. But it also might mean changing the form of government. So epistocracy is a, a phrase coined by my former colleague Dave Eslin down at Brown. And in an epistocracy, the difference between that and a democracy is not that about representative government. You keep all the same sorts of institutions that we have already, but you don't by default have universal equal basic suffrage. So you might have a system in which everyone can vote, but only if they first pass a, a quiz of very basic political knowledge. And that might mean that children, in, that might enfranchise a large number of people, like immigrants and felons who are currently excluded. But it also might exclude people who currently are included. Another proposal to come from John Stuart Mill would be a system in which everyone by default gets one vote, but by if you pass some sort of credentialing system, you get an additional vote. Another system might be one in which everything is passed through a democratic legislature, but there are certain bands of epistocrats who have the power to veto democratic legislation. So perhaps the Council of Economic Advisors can veto democratic legislation on the grounds that it's incompetent in the same way that uh, a Supreme Court can veto democratic legislation on the grounds that it's unconstitutional. Um, another system which I, is of interest and kind of wonky idea is what I call government by simulated oracle. Um, in that kind of system, what happens is everyone votes. When you vote, you take a quiz of basic political knowledge, you write down your demographic information, and you write down what it is you want, what your policy preferences are. When you got that, that data all together, you can then statistically determine using like second semester statistics what the American public would want if only it were fully informed while correcting for whatever influence demographic information has. Now, there's a lot of problems with these proposals. Um, uh, I don't, I'm not worried about it so much like what it would say about people, and so I don't, I don't find the expressivist arguments for democracy persuasive. But for me, it's just thinking about alternatives to democracy. Is it worth exploring these things? Is it worth writing papers on them? Is it worth experimenting with them at some point and seeing if we can come up with a better system than just pure, straight democracy? I mean, another idea that I don't really put in the book, but I'm interested in, uh, comes from the economist Robin Hansen, who's actually at your university. Uh, it's called Futurarchy, and the idea here is that rather than having people vote, you have them make bets. There's certain kinds of bets they can use in information markets, and you can use this to predict policy and make choices about policy. And the reason behind this is something like, when you place a bet on a belief, like suppose my neighbor, all my neighbors are Democrats, so this would never happen, but suppose my neighbor says, uh, you know, if Hillary wins, then the economy is going to go into the toilet. Well, I could then say to that person, oh, you want to bet? You want to put $5,000 on that? So we'll, we'll operationalize what you mean by the, the economy is going to tank, and then we'll place a conditional bet. And then if the economy, say, gets cut in half, or there's a recession, I pay you five grand. If it doesn't, then you pay me five grand at the end of her term. When you ask people that, they'll quickly shut up. 
because uh, they don't really want to bet on their beliefs. But when you actually bet on their beliefs, then they're more likely to be honest, and these systems have better predictive power than just asking people their opinion. So I'm open to all of these things. I think they're worth economists and others thinking about them. It's not to say that any of them are going to work. We don't know. It's in a sense speculation at this point, and there's certainly like potential problems for abuse. That said, for me, I think the question isn't, what would be the ideal system? The ideal system comes from Dr. Horrible. It's anarchy that I rule. But uh, what's, what system is going to be best overall, warts and all, flaws and all, problems and all? So we're going to continue to talk for about five more minutes before we open up to Q&A. Uh, at this time, though, I would like to invite those of you who do have questions for the panelists to come to one of the four uh, microphones. There's two down here. There's two in the loges up there uh, to get some, uh, some questions ready. Uh, in the meantime, Ilya, uh, what's wrong with Jason's proposal, right? So why don't you go for epistocracy? Why do you, why do you stop short of that? So I'm ambivalent about Jason's ideas. On the one hand, uh, I think it's definitely worth considering, and it's actually much less radical uh, than it sounds. So if you read some of the reviews of Jason's books, uh, they say things like, this is horrible, he would disenfranchise some people, or he would give other people extra votes because they know more. We would never do that. No self-respecting, liberal-minded, good person would support this. But we already disenfranchise nearly a quarter of the population because we think they're ignorant or incompetent, and we don't even give them a chance to prove otherwise, we call those people children, right? They're all completely disenfranchised and uh, very few people have a problem with it. Uh, we also disenfranchise some adults on this basis. Many states disenfranchise some of the mentally ill for similar reasons. Uh, we also disenfranchise all immigrants unless they've been here for at least five years and unless they pass a civics test that studies suggest many native-born Americans would probably fail. So essentially, we probably already disenfranchise probably some 30% or more of the population based on considerations about competence and ignorance. And many of Jason's proposals are like saying, let's take the 30% and add another 5% or something. And then people say, that's radical and horrible. But the 30%, that's perfectly fine. No problem. Uh, no matter how knowledgeable a 17-year-old is, we can disenfranchise him just on the assumption that people of his or her age group are uh, ignorant or incompetent. But if we do the same thing with a 19-year-old, then we're terrible people and we can't show ourselves in uh, polite society. So in that respect, uh, I think some of Jason's ideas make sense, but there are a bunch of problems, some of which Jason does recognize in his book. Uh, one is, do we trust the government to make these decisions about who gets extra votes, what the test should be, how these, uh, the oracle should be structured and so forth. Obviously, government officials have all kinds of self-interested biases, the most obvious one being they would want to skew the system towards those who support their party and against those who oppose it. And that's even before we think about things like racial, ethnic, gender, and other biases of various kinds. So I'm not optimistic uh, that we can do this with real world government. Jason mentioned, well, deliberative Democrats uh, have this sort of ideal in mind of sort of what would be the ideal deliberation uh, if everybody followed the norms, uh, norms which probably even professional scholars usually don't follow when we deliberate. Uh, and I agree, those people are unrealistic, but I think uh, Jason, while he's more careful in his discussion of this than some of the more careless deliberative Democrats are, I think there is this, still this sort of sense that we can have a sort of uh, benevolent regime setting up this sort of system uh, to make it work. So I think, at least at this point, the problem with epistocracy, ironically, is we don't know how to make it work. We don't know enough, and we don't know how to make a real world government make it stick, whereas I would argue we do know how to decentralize and limit the powers of government. It has been done to some degree in the past, and we can do more of it. Indeed, some other liberal democracies, much like our own, have actually succeeded in uh, limiting and decentralizing their governments more than they were before. The recent history of Canada and New Zealand and some other countries is, is instructive. So I think I'm proposing at least a more realistic reform program than, uh, than Jason, and also one that goes less against people's intuitions about the value of democratic participation and how we should all be equal. I don't fully share those intuitions myself, but I say, why should we trample on them uh, unless we're, we're pretty confident that by trampling on them, we'll achieve a good result. 
Okay, thank you. So we're gonna open this up to questions. Uh, standard rules of the forum in terms of questions. Please state your name, what part of the university you're from. Uh, a short question that in fact ends with a question mark, therefore a short question that is in fact uh, a question. Uh, and uh, we'll start with you, yes. Well, wow, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jack and I'm a sophomore at the college. My question is, do you think that a lot of this sort of talk about having elites play a larger role in government governance is what led to Trump and stifles populist movements like his? Who wants to start with that? Uh, you know, it's clear that there's a lot of resentment from a certain class of voters and they see <laughs> You know, it used to be left versus right, and now it's almost the open versus the closed society divide, the city versus like rural areas. Uh, if you read, uh, you know, and, and there is a sort of antagonism towards elites and the view that elites are not governing on behalf of, uh, of people in rural areas and so on. Um, I think you're getting the same kind of thing in Brexit. Um, so that's probably true. And in a sense, uh, there's a really good book called Affluence and Influence that's looking at what politicians do. And if, if you know what the median voter theorem is, it's the claim that what politicians will tend to do is whatever the median voter wants. And it turns out empirically that's probably not true. It turns out that, in fact, politicians have significant leeway to do what they prefer. And they tend to side rather with higher income voters who also coincidentally and happen to be high information voters. Um, so they're rebelling against that. Uh, that said, it's not clear that it's a good kind of rebellion because I don't, I'm, I'm willing to be judgmental and it's like, yeah, I think Trump voters, you're wrong. You're wrong about the effects of trade. You're wrong about the effects of immigrants. You're wrong about the number of immigrants. You're wrong about the policies that you, that you advocate. Things are, the, there are bad things happening in your towns and they're not being caused by stuff that's ha that Hillary Clinton and others are doing. They're being caused by an entirely different set of factors. And the way we know that is through rigorous social scientific investigation. So I think, yes, they're rebelling against elites, but they're not right to do so. Melissa, did you want well, to? Uh, yeah, I'd like to jump in on this. Um, you know, I think that one could argue that they're rebelling against elites, and they have good reason to, for precisely the reasons that Jason just mentioned, citing the uh, uh, the book Affluence and Influence. Elites are not legislating in the interest of the average citizen. Uh, and so, if we look, for example, at the returns to the globalization of of trade, uh, the the economic growth that that's generated, and how the the lion's share of that growth has been redistributed to a very very small segment of the population at the top of the in income distribution. Whereas people, especially in the, the, the third and fourth quintiles of the population, so not the lowest income groups, but the next two layers on top of that, they've actually, through the la over the last 30 years during this era of trade liberalization, they've, their incomes have stagnated and ha in some cases have, have fallen off. So those are the voters who have mobilized uh, and uh, who um, are, are disaffected with elites, and I think that they have good reason to. I think that people are, are tapping, that some leaders, both Sanders and Trump, are, are tapping into that. To bring it back to epistocracy, this is part of the problem I have with this view, is why would we think that a political system based on restricting the vote to the most informed, who are also likely to be white, and more privileged and male, uh, why would we think that electors, that representatives who are accountable to those voters are going to be more inclined to generate policies that look after the interests of all citizens than the system we have right now? If we think that responsiveness to the interests of most citizens is a criterion of good governance, then I don't see how epistocracy can deliver it precisely because of the problem of cognitive bias, which, as Ilya mentioned, is not confined to low information voters. It's a human problem. We all suffer from this. It's, it's, a, it's a product of, uh, of, of evolution, one could say, that the heuristic uh, shortcuts that we developed when we lived in smaller, simpler societies don't work anymore in much more complex societies. Those biases would, would under an epistocracy, only, only uh, reinforce the tendencies to uh, promote policies that privilege an already privileged sector. Ilya, you want to jump on yeah. this as well? Yeah. So, 
I, as a couple of other things that were said already, I'm somewhat ambivalent about the issue of political elites and whether uh, they should be blamed for our problems or whether they get blamed too much. I think some of the charge against the elites are defensible, other ones much less so. But I do think there is a, a deep irony and really a tragedy with these populist movements, which on the one hand say the government is run by evil elites and they're not ruling in your interest, they're ruling in their self-interest, or as Trump says, they're stupid and they don't know what they're doing, and then what's the solution to that? Concentrate even more power in the hands of the government. As Trump says, I alone can do it, so uh, you, can, you should give me more power so that I can solve your problems. Uh, and even setting aside Trump and his particular ignorance and boorishness and other numerous flaws that I'm sure we could spend all night talking about if we wanted to, uh, there is this issue that if you have a large and powerful centralized government, even much better informed voters than we currently have are highly unlikely to be able to monitor it effectively. What we have now in the US is a government that at all levels spends almost 40% of gross domestic product, and that doesn't even count all of the other things that it does that are not necessarily on the government budget, like regulation and the like. So, necessarily by concentrating that much power in the hands of government, we're going to empower a relatively small and in many ways unrepresentative elite, whether it be an elite of technocrats and bureaucrats, or whether it be people like Trump, populist demagogues who uh, come to power by that route. So if we don't want elites to run as much of our lives as many of them currently do, uh, then what we want to do is not concentrate so much power in the hands of the state, particularly in a centralized government. To the contrary, what we want to do is make more of our decisions in other ways. And if you want to empower the ordinary people, which I want to do, let's empower them in a setting where they have good incentives to uh, acquire relevant information, to evaluate it wisely. Uh, you mentioned earlier, Melissa, the issue of proxies and the use them. I, mean, I agree, we do need to use proxies such as doctors. The question is, we want to be, a, want to have a setting where people have good incentives to go to doctors rather than witch doctors. Uh, and in the political system, the witch doctor phenomenon tends to uh, predominate because people have very little incentive to properly vet the those they trust in politics, in part because the individual voters' decisions have so little chance of making a difference. So as as a result, the witch doctors proliferate. Ultimately, Trump is just an extreme example of an effective political witch doctor. Uh, if somebody like this, if somebody acted like Trump uh, and uh, you were thinking about whether to buy an iPhone from him uh, or to have him come and serve you dinner, you probably wouldn't hire a guy like that. Uh, but a lot of voters are willing to hire a guy like him uh, to uh, run the country. There's an interesting disjunction between his success as an entertainment celebrity and uh, as a politician versus his uh, doings as a businessman where he lost uh, $900 million and also many banks now refuse to do business with him because he's so unreliable. Uh, and you know it's because people on average make better decisions when their choices make a difference. In those situations, they try not to deal with people like Trump, whereas the, the Trump types do much better uh, when they're in the political witness doctoring business, so I would suggest, at least at the margin, we should give that business less power over our lives than it currently has. Thank you, and thank you for your question. Rachel. Uh, hello. Rachel Estrada, and I am a mid-career MPA student here at the Kennedy School. Um, and I'm really glad you brought up disenfranchisement, and sort of what I'm hearing, and this is mostly towards Jason, um, are different ways to limit access to the ballot. And so what would you say to communities of color and women who have fought a very long time to actually increase access to the ballot? I mean, for what it's worth, I have lots and lots of pages about this in the book, so I'm not gonna, I can't really give you like the full answer to this right now. <laughs> so one thing, one thing is about what is the symbolic value of democracy? As a matter of fact, what we do with the right to vote in our country, in this country at least, I don't, I don't know where you're from, but from this, in this country, is use it as sort of the opposite of a Star of David. The Nazis made people wear the Star of David to sort of signify that they're inferior. We use the right to vote as a public expression of people's equality. So it's loaded with all this symbolic value, and because we load it with this kind of symbolic value, to fail to extend it to certain people is the equivalent of giving them the middle finger. So given that we have a culture like that, it's just inherently insulting to fail to give people the right to vote on any, on any grounds. Um, 
I think there's something problematic about a culture that actually imbues politics with that much status. So a lot of what I am trying to do with my work, even though in some ways at my own expense, is to lower the status of politics, lower the status of people who are heavily engaged in politics, and increase the status of non-political endeavors. So that's, it. so that's one thing. But then there's a question about participation itself and what would happen in a system of disenfranchisement. Like what if there were selective enfranchisement based on knowledge? Now for what it's worth, there are systematic differences among race, among gender, among uh, income groups. You know, middle-aged people no more than high, uh, old, elder or younger people. High income people no more than lower income people. Whites know a little bit more than blacks on average. Men know a little bit more than women on average. The effects are not huge. I mean, the main thing that really predicts whether you're knowledgeable or not is simply whether you're interested in politics, right? Um, how do people vote? Empirically, it turns out people don't vote their self-interest. Uh, there's overwhelming evidence of this over many, many years. They vote for what they perceive to be the national interest. They're nationalist sociotropes. The question is just whether they know what they're talking about. So I have here with me a magic wand. You can't see it because it's a real magic wand. The ones that magicians use that are black with the white tip, those are fake. This is a real wand that's invisible. And when I wave it, it will cause all women and all um, uh, citizens of color, is that the word that you use, to vote, then they will all vote and they'll all vote for Trump. Would you like me to wave the magic wand? Yes? I'll, I'll vote and they'll all, vote, they'll all vote for Trump. I don't want you to wave the wand, I just want people to exercise that right. And so a lot of what I'm hearing is ways to limit it to certain groups. And yeah. I think there has to be an acknowledgement of how hard those groups fought to even get to that point. Yeah. No, I fully acknowledge that given, given what it means, I think it's important that we've extended it. It was, I, as I say in the beginning of the book, it's a step in the right direction to have done that. But that said, if I were to wave the magic wand, the reason you probably wouldn't want me to wave it is because you probably agree that what would happen then is we'd get the wrong policies would actually undermine their interests rather than promote them. In a sense, it's not just the fact that you vote doesn't automatically translate into politics helping you. It depends on what you actually vote for. I think Trump voters are shooting themselves in the foot. It's not that I think Trump's going to help Trump voters and I want to stop them because I'm not Trump's type. I think he's going to hurt Trump voters and hurt me. So I think in a sense we all in effect agree that like what policies are being implemented actually matters. Um, and so the only reason I would ever be in favor of systematic in disenfranchisement or changes in the amount of weight that people have in voting is if it turned out that that would lead to better, income, better outcomes as defined independently of, of the procedure itself. Now, for what it's worth, we can actually look and see, like she, she, uh, Melissa brought up some questions about bias. We can actually look in, at high information voters and the kinds of things that they advocate and then see what are the effects of demographics. So there's a really good book on this by the political scientist Skalt Althaus. There's others who've done work on this as well. And we can actually test the hypothesis. Well, do they advocate this because they're white, because they're high income? Like, for example, I like free trade. Well, do I advocate free trade because I'm white, because I'm high income, because I live in Northern Virginia, because I live in a high immigration area? Or is it because I have high information? Well, we can't just tell looking at me, but when we look at Americans as a whole, we can now test the effect of those demographic factors versus information. We find it's actually not the demographic factors that are doing that, it's actually the information that's causing them to think this way. So, uh, Melissa, you wanted to... Uh, yeah, no, I think there are some real, um, real problems with this line of argument. I mean, quite apart from what I think you're drawing attention to, which is absolutely important, uh, the, that uh, the, the right to vote is a fundamental uh, right in part because it, it expresses, and here I do disagree with Jason, our commitment to the equal claim of each and every citizen to have his or her interests taken into account in the decisions that are made. Now what Jason is suggesting is that people who are high information, given that people actually generally use the vote in a uh, non-self-interested way, people who are high information know the interests of those low information voters better than those low information voters do themselves. Now, this is actually a story that men told women when women were seeking the franchise and whites told blacks when they were seeking the franchise and so on. So, uh, so that's one problem with it. The reason why that's a problem is because we actually don't think that men generally do know women's interests better than women know what their interests are. And that comes back to the problem of cognitive bias, the availability heuristic, and so on. We, we know that the, the, the information, the knowledge that's relevant to policy making with respect to, say, women's reproductive rights is not knowledge that might be, or to take a more current example, even more current example, say, sexual harassment or sexual assault. That information is not readily available to most men. Think about all the women, all the men 
the, the, uh, who were shocked in the last weeks to learn from their partners how much sexual abuse those partners had been subjected to over the course of their lives. They were genuinely shocked because women don't talk about it. They didn't have that knowledge to actually disconfirm the claims that, that uh, uh, you know, men don't actually do what, what Trump dis described himself uh, as doing in that hot mic incident. So, so the, the counter argument is actually there is knowledge is distributed across the population and the, the knowledge relevant to say race and policing is, uh, is going to be uh, concentrated, say, among those who are most subject to certain kinds of policing. We need to have that knowledge right in the policymaking process, and we need to have elected representatives who are accountable to the voters who have that knowledge from their experience. Uh, uh, I, Ilya, we're, uh, we'll have you jump on this, and then I'm going to at least try to get to one, one round here before we run out of time. In support of Jason, but also uh, at the end of reservation. In support of him, I think it's important to recognize that while it's certainly absolutely desirable that whites be equal with blacks, men with women, and so on, uh, we should not view the right to vote as simply just an entitlement that people have. Rather, it's also a responsibility. Uh, as John Stuart Mill said, voting is not just an exercise of your individual freedom. It's the exercise of power over other people. So when you, out of ignorance, vote for a politician who causes harm, he won't just cause harm to you. He will cause harm to others in society, and therefore, if you're the kind of person who, if you vote, uh, it's very likely that you will increase the chance of causing that kind of harm, then there's at least some argument, not, not saying necessarily a decisive argument, but there's at least some argument that you shouldn't vote. And in fact, we all, most of us, seem to accept that argument when it comes to children, immigrants who can't pass the civics test, and various other groups. So we should confront the possibility that if this argument is valid with respect to those groups, maybe it's also valid with respect to at least some of those who currently have the franchise. Uh, I think Jason is also right when he says most voters, according to data, don't vote based on their narrow self-interest. Very few people go to the polls saying, all I care about is voting for the candidate who's going to give me more money or my family more money. A few people maybe vote on that basis. The vast majority do not. There's a lot of data to show this. To take just one dramatic example, uh, the data suggests that the young support Social Security at roughly the same rates as elderly people do, even though obviously what Social Security Security does is it redistributes money from the young and the middle aged to some degree to those who are more elderly. So that's a, a powerful example. Another is that the, uh, the poor uh, support tax rates for the rich that are actually on average somewhat lower than those tax rates that the poor currently pay, uh, which uh, is a dramatic example that those people are not uh, reaching their views about tax rates just based on sort of their own narrow self-interest. On the other hand, the fact that you're not narrowly self-interested, or at least that most voters aren't, does not mean that they weigh everybody's interests equally. And there is a lot of data suggesting that uh, many people, including people who in their own minds think of themselves as unbiased and uh, not racist or whatnot, but they do tend to value the interests of members of other racial and ethnic groups, or even more so the people from other nations, immigrants and the like, uh, they tend to uh, set a lower uh, value on their interests and needs and freedom uh, than on their own, and that is a serious source of bias. Doesn't automatically prove that Jason's proposals are wrong. He has various v arguments for how we can, in effect, uh, do these sorts of proposals, but also maintain demographic balance in the electorate. But it's a caution that merely concluding that most voters are not narrowly self-interested does not mean that voters uh, have good motivations. Indeed, narrowly self-interested motivations may actually be less harmful than motivations which are not self-interested or not narrowly self-interested, but which try to exalt uh, one set of racial or ethnic or demographic groups uh, at the expense of another one. If you look at the really harmful policies in our history, most of them are of that second kind, uh, using the power of one group to suppress another, rather of the kind that are implemented because people are just voting their pocketbook. All right, thank you. Uh, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Kanal Masoon at the Kennedy School, and I have a question about the, the role of the media. Uh, one of the main ways voters still get informed is through the news and through platforms designed to kind of uh, present the news to people. Um, and I'm wondering, as long as media companies are optimized uh, for profit, where they have to cater to uh, grab viewers and give them information that'll keep them coming back, 
Can a media company effectively be nonpartisan and serve the social good? Or uh, do you see any major changes in the media landscape taking place? Yeah, I have a discussion of this in my book. A lot of people blame the media for political ignorance. What they say is, if only the media covered politics in the right way, not horse race coverage, but real substantive coverage of issues, then political knowledge would be much better. Instead of talking about who's ahead in the polls, we would talk about Trump's health care plan to the extent that he has one versus Hillary Clinton's health care plan. We would talk about meaty policy issues or others propose other kinds of differences in the coverage of politics. The problem with this sort of perspective is that there already is a lot of really good political information about policy out there on the internet and even in some of the media. If you want to watch substantive discussions of policy, turn on C-SPAN. It's great. It has lots and lots of great for it, just like this one. Uh, I highly recommend it, but only a very small proportion of voters actually take that recommendation because unlike me, they don't find it interesting. They prefer to flip on reality TV or something else. So the problem is not that the media isn't supplying us the right information. There's all kinds of information out there packaged in all sorts of different ways. Is that most of us, for the rational reasons that we talked about earlier, prefer either not to spend much time looking at that information, or when we do look at it, we look at the kind that confirms our pre-existing views. The, the really committed conservatives, they watch Fox News. The liberals may watch MSNBC, uh, and so on. Melissa, you want to say yeah. This too. I mean, I think that the fragmentation of the media, which includes now not only all of the commercial stations, the commercial programs that each have their own uh, niche markets, but then the proliferation of, of other forms of uh, social media, blogs, and so on, um, it does reinforce the tendencies to cognitive bias of putting our, li limiting ourselves to our own little silos and not uh, finding out information from other sources. And I think that's a real problem. So how do we deal with that? And, in the age of new social media, of, of digital technologies, and so on. Um, I don't have an easy solution to this, but one possible solution is to take another look at, at public uh, media. Uh, and so I have lived in Canada for many years. We have uh, the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. We can look at B BBC. We can look at public media in, in other countries. And I do think that they, and I haven't looked at studies of this, so. Um, I, I can't uh, offer any authoritative argument, but I do think there may be some tendency for the existence of strong public media to have a moderating effect on uh, other media in the market. Um, and so I think that might be one thing to look at. In the interest of time, we have time for one more question, then we have to wrap this up. So I'd like to just get one more question out here. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Dora. I'm a sophomore at the college. Uh, so you've spoken a lot tonight about an American reverence and how sacred we hold democracy and the Constitution to be. And a lot of the solutions that uh, you proposed in epistocracy um, kind of monetize democracy in a way. And so how do we reconcile this kind of these new suggestions, which would, in some people's view, degrade uh, democracy? And how do we reformat how we conceptualize democracy and how we conceptualize what democracy can do for us? Thank you. Jason, you want to start with that? Yeah, you know, in the abstract, there's a question of what kind of value democracy has. And I like to say, like, a couple models. Model one is, it has the value that a hammer has. A hammer is a tool, it has a purpose, we only care about whether it works for us, and no one would insist on using a, a hammer if they have a better hammer, or use a hammer if a wrench would be even better. Another way of thinking about the value of democracy is the way we think of the value of paintings. We care about what they symbolize, what emotions they evoke, what they mean, and who made them. So if I scribble on a napkin and Picasso does the exact same scribble, the Picasso scribble is worth a lot more than my scribble. And many people think of democracy as having that value, what it expresses and who made it. And finally, there's a view that uh, you might think democracy is an end in itself. I mean, there are even people who go so far as to say that whatever democracy does is just simply because a democracy decided to do it, that there's no sort of external constraints on democracy. So my view is a very economistic view of democracy. I just think of it as it's a set of institutions. They work pretty well. If we ever find a better set of institutions that better produce justice defined independently, I'm perfectly happy to implement them, whatever they happen to be. If that means making you dictator, I'm happy to have you dictator. If that means picking things at random, I'm happy to do that. If it means having queens for the day, I'm happy to do that. Um, 
So I just think democracy is an instrument. And a lot of really, what the, when I'm saying it's against democracy, really the book is not meant to be democracy is a bad thing, we should get rid of it, but rather we should limit our idea of democracy to it being simply of instrumental value and nothing more. Everything else is a mistake. That, that's a, a, a great uh, opportunity to ask for wrap-ups. I think, I think Jason, that, that summarizes your, your views. Uh, Ilya, for like a minute or so, and then Melissa, and then we'll, we'll close this up. Your, your final thoughts? Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah. The title of this forum is whether democracy is in crisis, and we can argue about what it means to be in crisis, but I think there's no question that democracy has very serious problems, and those problems are not primarily the result of the evils of particular candidates, even Donald Trump, or the evils of particular political parties like the Democrats and Republicans, but rather they're structurally built into it in that extremely important decisions that uh, are literally matters of life and death, they are decided far too often by systems where ignorance, prejudice, illogic plays an enormous role. Now, we can't completely get rid of it, uh, and we should be cautious about uh, being too radical too quickly, but I do think uh, that we can at least at the margin make this problem better by decentralizing and limiting government power, as a number of other democracies have done with some success, like Switzerland and more recently Canada and others. Uh, and uh, if we do that, we can make more of the decisions, uh, like the iPhone decision, and fewer like the ones that we currently do at the ballot box. And by the way, when we do this, we can empower not elites, but actually ordinary people, because ordinary people throughout the history of America actually uh, have done well by voting with their feet. Indeed, we are a nation, most of us, of people who either are immigrants like myself who voted with their feet or uh, descendants of people who did so. So if we want to make America great again, maybe that's a direction that we should uh, try to move into. To, uh, at least to some substantial degree. Thank you, and Melissa. Yeah, so I want to acknowledge that my, my colleagues have pointed out some problems with democracy that I want to also recognize as problems. We didn't get to talk about the problem of polarization, which I think is a very serious problem in contemporary democracies, and one of the f dimensions in which we might really think it is in crisis, uh, which connects with issues of, of political knowledge and so on, but unfortunately we weren't able to go there. But I also think we should come back to the point that Chris started us off with, was noting that confidence in democracy as the best regime type is diminishing. It's dropping fast, especially among youth, but we can also see confidence in democracy and a greater tolerance for authoritarianism rising uh, in the United States and across Europe. And I think we should be seriously worried about that. Because when most people look at the flaws in our democracies, they don't tend to look to epistocracy or decentralization as the alternative. They look to authoritarianism. And I think we are at real risk of uh, sliding in that direction and that we have a responsibility when we're pointing up the flaws of democracy to remind ourselves and to remind others that on the really big metrics of what is most important, the metrics we should really count, uh, care about, performance on human rights, avoidance of catastrophes such as great famines, uh, the tendency not to go to war with one another, the tendency on average to produce better public goods and, and on average over time more growth than non-democracies. But we have to remind ourselves that democracies perform better on each of these metrics than do authoritarian regimes. And whatever our critiques of existing democracies, we should not lose sight of that because we could find ourselves in a very dangerous time where the alternative is not epistocracy, it's not decentralization, it's not liberalization, it's authoritarianism. That's the challenge we're facing right now. I'm of the opinion that uh, tremendous learning can occur when you see uh, tremendous intellectual minds wrestle with really hard issues publicly, and uh, I think you, you saw that in front of you today. So please uh, join me in thanking our panelists very much for doing that. Thank you. Thank you, we're all set, thank you.